So uh, thanks again for showing up this morning. And our first uh, talk to kick us off is Battling Super Mutants in the Fishing Wasteland. Please give a warm schmookon welcome to uh, Ashley Benj and Zach Allen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so this is our talk, Battling Super Mutants in the Fishing Wasteland. So a quick agenda, uh, we'll do uh, the Who Am I slide, um, and then we're going to get into what we call surveying the wasteland. So this talk is not really about fishing, it's more about the, the wasteland behind fishing, so the, the market behind it. So if you're interested in cybercrime or learning more about cybercrime, uh, we hope that this presentation can kind of give you a good introduction to that. Right after we survey the wasteland, I'm going to pass it off to Ashley, and she will give a uh, fishing kit economy breakdown. So important thing to note with any type of cybercrime is that there's always an economy behind it. And so as we kind of dissect this eco uh, economy and these different types of fishing kits, it's important to note that you're not just reversing code, you're also reversing uh, a lot of the money, or money rather, that goes behind this code and how it's funded and how it's sold. Lastly, um, we're gonna go into some case studies on these different fishing kits and a couple groups uh, that go and sell these uh, different types of um, uh, fishing infrastructure, and then lastly, we'll end it with um, some research resources, because everyone here can help out with battling fishing, um, especially fishing kits, and kind of like a quick getting starting guide. So, uh, quick, who am I? My name is Zach Allen. I'm the Director of Threat Intelligence at Zero Fox. Uh, I believe this is my 10th ShmooCon. Um, I presented a few years ago, I think like four or five years ago. I'm happy to be back. This is still my favorite conference to go to. I'm even happier to present at it. Uh, I do threat research at Zero Fox, uh, which is pretty cool. I get to do research into really whatever interests me, so that's pretty nice. Um, before I joined Zero Fox about nine months ago, I uh, actually got my start in security at Cisco's Talos Intelligence Group. Uh, and before that, uh, I was actually doing computational astrophysics, so that has absolutely no relevance to my current job. <laughs> but if you'd like to talk about space explosions, I can probably give you some insight there. We ask her about aliens all the time. <laughs> cool. So uh, for those that haven't figured it out, uh, um, or those that just don't play video games, we, we took a theme uh, with this presentation. Um, so the theme is from a video game called Fallout. And uh, it's really important to kind of draw analogies, especially when you're first learning about something, because it just helps you kind of understand um, the concept behind it in the bigger picture. So we'll make a few references to Fallout. If you've never played, that's OK. We'll make sure that we can kind of bring everyone up to speed. But the most important thing about this talk, it's not a talk about phishing attacks. So I think that uh, when I first started security um, and learning about it in school and things like that, reading the news, I, I knew what a phishing attack was. If you go and ask my parents, they kind of know what a phishing attack is, things like that. Um, but this is not a talk about it. Um, but for those that don't know what phishing attacks are, I'm going to give you a quick two-minute intro to it. So phishing attacks specifically uh, target um, what I like to call the uh, user experience context. So if I go and I show this, uh, these two pictures to somebody, one being the PayPal login page, one being a phishing site, if you have no other knowledge about security or how to reverse these things, um, you're probably going to be 50-50 in terms of choosing which one's the real one, which one's the legit one, or which one's the real one, which one's the phishing page. So for those that do know how to reverse phishing pages a little bit more, you can look at things like domains, you can look at things like uh, the email address it came from. Um, Probably the easiest way is to go and look at the source code of the web page. Most phishing, <laughs> uh, most phishing kits, uh, they have um, they have some type of call to action associated with them. Um, they'll also use JavaScript, or they'll use some type of form action to go and uh, take personally identifiable information and put it in attacker infrastructure. This specific one um, goes and it says when a username and password is put in, run this login e function. Um, and which is rendered in this master JavaScript file. It'll pull these two forms out, it'll make sure that they're not empty, and it'll do some type of get request somewhere to go and put that in attacker infrastructure. Um, phishing pages don't have to do this. I've seen phishing pages where they'll write it to a file locally on the web server, they'll send out an email instead. Really, the point is, it's confusing um, the end user on whether or not this is the legitimate web page, and they're taking some type of data um, and when you first learn about this, it's username and passwords, and it's putting it somewhere. But especially uh, as we kind of move along, and we'll show this timeline of how phishing attacks have evolved, it's not just usernames and passwords anymore. 
So this is the same phishing kit um, where it's asking you to upload a selfie with your ID card. So for those that, um, that don't know, uh, a lot of account recovery processes, um, especially if it's something very valuable like a PayPal account or anything like that, they'll actually require you to put a selfie and like, your, like my Maryland ID for example and I'm sitting there looking at a webcam taking a picture and I have to send it to somebody who can verify that. And so a lot of these kits are getting more advanced where they're trying to fish out this type of information. And a lot of these kits and a lot of these pages as well have something called a call to action. So a lot of the times you'll see that in an email that says, oh my gosh, all your assets are frozen on PayPal, you're about to lose everything, you have to get on and verify your information right now. So there's this sense of urgency. And this also helps prey on people that um, don't necessarily know what phishing attacks are. All they just know that is they got an email, it didn't hit the spam filter, and they said, you're about to lose everything, log on right now um, and give us this information to get your account back. So um, when we're looking at phishing attacks, a uh, really useful tool for any type of security research, it's not just like for this talk, is, is Google. And Google, you can go and look at interest over time from the search engine. So what you see here is uh, the time of interest for the blue line, which is people searching malware on Google, and the red line, um, searching phishing on Google. And, and to me, this is the beginning of time, which is Google's uh, when they first started indexing in 2004. But as you can see, malware is always kind of beating phishing. It's kind of like the sexier thing. There's uh, nation states associated with it. There's a lot of spy stuff. Uh, there are banks being taken over, things like that. Where phishing, it's like, oh, my grandma, she put something in, she lost some money, she had to call the bank, she got her card reissued, things like that. So it's important to note that. Um, but what's really interesting, uh, this is a graph that I generated from Google Safe Browsing, um, is that you can also track the amount of malware websites and phishing websites that Google uh, deemed unsafe and um, detected per week, which you see here. And what you notice is this kind of shift where these lines aren't really that separated or uh, they're not as close, they start separating and phishing gets to be way, way more prevalent uh, around 2017. Um, and you can go and you can explore that website and there are a couple other tools you can play with. This one is number of sites deemed dangerous by safe browsing. So even though the interest has always been malware has like, is basically more interesting for people searching on Google than phishing, um, Google safe browsing is definitely focusing more on the phishing kits or phishing rather. You can draw some uh, kind of um, assumptions from this. Maybe browser security is getting better. Maybe exploit kin kits aren't a thing anymore. Uh, or maybe just phishing, um, at least in this case, and what we're exploring today, is just becoming more accessible and it's harder to catch than something like an exploit kit. But remember, this is not a talk about phishing attacks. So I talked about the economy before. And basically, when you look at an economy of any type of cybercrime, you want to look at what happens before and after the attack. And so this is like the more interesting thing, at least to me and when we perform this research. So um, I said uh, the term phishing kits a couple times. Um, this has been uh, researched quite a lot in the last few years, uh, kind of pointing back to the Google safe browsing, almost as if 2017 happened, you saw all these different websites being loaded into Google safe browsing, and now we're starting to get more and more research uh, from it. Uh, this is a really good kind of TLDR of a phishing kit um, and how it works. It was done by Duo. Um, Duo has done a lot of work uh, in this area. But basically, um, a phishing kit specifically is just a really fast way and really economical way to deploy um, a type of phishing attack infrastructure. And so you want to scale these attacks. It's not about like a spear phishing thing where you're looking for that one email address and one password. You want to scale your cybercrime economy by stealing as much as possible. And phishing kits are really the way that you can kind of uh, do that at scale. And so we went and we actually searched hashtag phishing kit on Twitter. We went all the way back in time, uh, as much as Twitter can give us in terms of um, people talking about it. Um, and what you see here is uh, even though phishing has gotten uh, to be more and more uh, prevalent in Google safe browsing in 2017, people weren't really talking about phishing kits uh, until the end of 2018 going into 2019 as you see here. So uh, it's definitely an area of research that people need to focus more on. Um, and uh, Twitter is actually a really great place to go and get a lot of details about that. So before uh, I talked about analogies, and when I first started in security, uh, I, I was on Blue Team, and basically I had a really good boss who used a lot of analogies, and maybe that's probably why I'm using a lot here. But he told me that um, being on a Blue Team is like being on a, on a ship in a storm. Um, it, it may be you know, an old wooden ship, perhaps. Uh, but basically, the way, 
the way like he broke it down um, was that things like the hole, for example, the hole could be just like your perimeter security. Um, and the more you can kind of fortify it, fortify your perimeter, um, it can withstand attacks going out in the ocean. Um, the sales, like the wind in your sales could be everything from funding to the people on your team um, and things like that. Uh, but it's important to make sure that the ship is um, it's kept going when you're on a security team. The lightning bolts can be any number of random factors that can happen that can attack your organization. Um, and then the sea itself is just the general chaotic nature of the internet. And so I really like this analogy because it really kind of helped frame uh, what I thought security was at the time. And so when we talk about the wasteland, we're, um, we're going to do the similar analogy. Um, so for those that don't know, uh, quick uh, TLDR for the Fallout universe, basically a nuclear explosion happened in the US, actually a couple nuclear explosions, and Fallout from that nuclear expo uh, explosion rendered this video game where you play this character that moves throughout the wasteland. Um, and when you kind of describe the, the game to somebody, it's, it's post-apocalyptic, so a nuclear bomb happens. Um, there's a lot of pockets of economy and just badness overall. So you can explore this wasteland. You can find people buying and selling things. You can find monsters and mutants and things like that. Um, there's a lot of drugs. There's a ton of drugs in this, in this game. Um, so you can get addicted to drugs. You can get other people addicted to drugs. You can sell them. You can buy them, things like that. Um, there are secret factions. There are hidden vaults. And there's just lots of crime and a patchwork economy. So the US dollar isn't a thing. And so people pay with bottle caps from this uh, fictional game cola. So basically, when I was thinking about this game more and more, it's, it's pretty much equivalent to cybercrime in the dark web. Um, it's post-apocalyptic, so basically the internet happens. A lot of drugs on the dark web, a lot of drugs. Um, there's pockets of economy there, so Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, things like that. Um, and you know, there are secret vaults and hidden places that you can get into. And for the record, uh, I always make fun of people that do the whole, like, I'm going to write an article or a blog post with like a hacker like this. I googled cybercrime, this was like one of the first images, so I had to put it on there. Um, but what's kind of important to note, it's not just, you know, random and chaotic. There's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of econ, <laughs> there's a little bit of like eco economic flair that goes into it. And so for those that don't know who the bottom right person is, this is a fictional character from, uh, he was an investor in the show Silicon Valley. And the interesting thing about this character and all the investors in that show, and for those that work in the startup world, basically any investor you meet, they're a little quirky. Um, and they're, they have these um, moments of brilliance where they can kind of see an opportunity and capitalize on it. And when you think of cybercrime, uh, you may think that these are like bad people, they're being chaotic, they're the hackers in the hoodie. Um, but a lot of the times there are a lot of really brilliant people that may not be in the best situation geopolitically or anything like that. Um, but they, they have these uh, really interesting ways to kind of capitalize on what people need in the cybercrime economy. And so, Speaking of hackers and hoodies, for those that do want to get into cybercrime, um, I highly recommend this research study by, done by um, someone named Dr. Michael McGuire. Um, it's basically a deep dive research on cybercrime operations, which includes revenues from crime sources, money laundering, and cryptocurrency. And so until you kind of understand this, this web of profit, as Dr. McGuire put, um, you can't really understand and kind of catch malware or phishing or any type of cyber criminals at scale. So um, in the research paper, uh, it outlines a shift to something called platform capitalism. So platform capitalism, you can go Google that right now. Basically, everyone here being in security has probably learned about it and experienced it, whether you're part of it or not. So there's a reason why everyone at your company has a LinkedIn profile. A lot of them have Facebook profiles. There's a lot of different apps that can integrate within kind of like your company workflow. These are all platforms. And so much like we've integrated into this type of platform economy um, and platform capitalism, so is cybercrime. And they do it through the use of existing platforms. You'd be really surprised on the amount of results you can get if you go on Facebook right now and type in uh, credit card buy full and see all the different Facebook pages and people that you can just message to buy credit cards that were stolen. Um, and so this is something that a lot of these cyber criminals do. And when things kind of get uh, a little bit more secretive or they want to bring it kind of offline of these platforms, they go into um, these cybercrime platforms that people specialize in developing. So uh, people here probably heard of things like Alpha Bay. Um, I know there's a lot of dark web. Uh, I, I have to put double quotes when I say dark web. It's like, it's like this thing now that I can't control. I, even on sales calls, I'm like, dark web. So, um, <laughs> But basically, uh, these cybercrime platforms, a lot of the people that operate it, they don't do cybercrime the way some people might think. They don't drop malware in someone's machine. They don't fish anyone. They basically just hold this service that's almost like Mark Zuckerberg running a dark web forum, 
people can log on, exchange information with each other, and buy and sell goods. That's all they do. And so until you really understand that, um, then you could start to kind of uh, get really into deconstructing a lot of these different types of economies. So back um, to kind of like the Peter Gregory plus the hooded hacker, um, it's really important just to show that uh, the people that we go and defend against every day, whether we're working law enforcement or threat research and things like that, they're a lot smarter than you think, and you shouldn't underestimate them. Um, they may do some things well, they may do some things not so well, they're human like the rest of us, um, but uh, as we kind of dig deeper into some of the people that we've been tracking, um, they probably could use a lesson or two on things like OPSEC. So um, I said phishing kits a couple times. You probably also heard this as phishing as a service. Um, I don't really know what the, the uh, abbreviation is, P-H-A-A-S, P-A-A-S, something like that. I've seen a couple blogs like that go all over the place, probably including one I have written. Um, but phishing kits and phishing as a service, it's much like SaaS, software as a service. There's a really good uh, ZDNet article um, that basically said, if you want to be a software as a service company, um, you need to have basically four pillars. And so as you go and you look at these SaaS uh, products that you may be using at your work every day or looking to buy, they probably fall into these categories. And the interesting thing is, at least when it comes to phishing as a service, they also fall into cate these categories. The actors that we talk about today, are all they all have a partner strategy. So they partner with resellers, uh, they partner with integrations, they build integrations for these kits, so it's really important. Um, every single kit that we're looking at today has pricing, packaging, and selling. Um, so if you go to my company's website right now and you click pricing, you'll see the packaging, you'll see the pricing on there, things like that. It's eerily similar, at least when it comes to phishing kits. And I've also seen it for a lot of ransomware as a service as well. There's an as a service infrastructure. So um, even though it's in the name, it's really important to point out that um, when you look at these, it's not like uh, when Facebook was created and you wanted to create an account, you had to call a tech support line, get an account, and they'll create it for you. There's no way they could have scaled to the platform that they had today. And so this is very similar to the phishing kits that we'll look at. Everything is as a service, and it's the only way they can um, really scale and make a lot of money is to make it like that. And lastly, uh, there's a lot of customer relationships. So this is really interesting um, if you're looking into cybercrime. Um, we'll give you a model on how to kind of target different parts of like this as a service infrastructure, but one of the places you can actually glean a lot of information are customer support channels. So there are Telegram groups, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, um, IRC channels that you can just go and see people saying, hey, I tried deploying via DigitalOcean with this shell script. Did somebody like run into this before? And you're seeing these like cyber criminals having this troubleshooting thing in real time. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is nuts. Um, so it, it's, it's really important information to kind of look at. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be my last slide where I'm throwing, um, you know, kind of like the startup-y kind of thing at everyone. So a lot of extremely smart people, uh, probably with many MBAs, went and built this thing called the Amazon Flywheel. And so the Amazon Flywheel, this is basically how Amazon goes into the trillion dollar valuation that it is today. Uh, the, really it breaks down to, um, as you increase any portion of this wheel, uh, everything else downstream gets bigger and the area of growth gets bigger. So if you increase selection in Amazon, you have better selection. That means customers are going to have a better experience. Better customer experience means better, and uh, there's more traffic going to the website, which means more traffic, more sellers, with a lower cost structure, lower prices, and basically this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, what we did is we took a stab at this um, flywheel when we're analyzing fishing kits. And the basic premise behind it is anytime anyone here wants to hunt a fishing kit infrastructure, um, you should target one of five, or I mean all of uh, the different steps within this flywheel. And so as these authors uh, try to make marketing better, try to make their selling experience better, the education experience, the, the better that gets, the bigger the flywheel gets. And as defenders and researchers, the more we target these different steps of the flywheel, the smaller now you're playing this cat and mouse game. Um, so. With that being said, I'm going to pass it off to Ashley, and she's going to go over all the fishing kits we've been tracking for the last year. Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, so I think we are running a little short on time because we started late, so I'm going to try and slam all of this into uh, as little time as possible. Uh, but I'm going to walk through a couple of different fishing kits that we've been tracking according to the model that Zach just showed you. Um, so we'll talk about each of those points as they relate to each of these kits. So if you are at all um, doing research in this industry, you've probably, or niche field, I guess, within this industry, you've probably heard of both of the names that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, so the first one is a, 
uh, actor called Casanova Hacker, or Hexer, or however you want to say this. Uh, this person goes by a couple of different aliases. Uh, but this person also sells kits that are targeting kind of the standard phishing kit targets. Uh, we've got PayPal, uh, we've got Netflix, um, and a couple other uh, kits as well. And so generally, in terms of targeting, we see quite a lot of overlap. Um, the targets that these actors tend to pick are the ones that represent the most lucrative uh, accounts if they were to compromise them. Uh, and so you can see that financial services accounts or bank accounts are very attractive for phishing kits. Um, and the people that are using these kits, they may not necessarily want to uh, drain these bank accounts themselves directly, uh, but they're also very, very valuable in terms of resell on other criminal forums. And so we kind of get to uh, potential groups here that are using these kits either to gain direct access to accounts uh, or to gain access to them in, able, in order to be able to sell them. And so you'll see uh, some commonality between the targets of this kit and then the targets of the kit that I'll talk about next. Uh, to give you a little bit of an overview uh, in terms of timeline for uh, this actor, uh, this person has been doing kind of petty defacement since as early as 2011. Uh, and in 2015, they finally rolled out uh, kind of a more adult uh, version of their software in the form of a mass mailer that Symantec actually documented on a pretty good blog post. Uh, they first started to venture into actual phishing kit related activity in 2017. Uh, and so they did this by making a Facebook page to advertise this. Uh, and when this Facebook page was taken down, it actually had about 20,000 likes and 50,000 followers. Uh, so this is a pretty extensive reach in terms of marketing. And so this is actually a pretty common thing that we see, uh, that social media platforms tend to be used for advertisement because generally phishing kit authors are wanting to attract uh, kind of the, the lowest level of technical ability. And so it may be hard for you to access a criminal forum of any kind if you have no idea what you're doing. Uh, but at the bare minimum you, minimum, you probably have some kind of social media account, and so it's easy enough to go search for uh, phishing kit or scam or what have you in Facebook and have something come up. Uh, so we started seeing uh, the advertisement in 2017. Uh, started out uh, targeting PayPal, Office, and Netflix. Uh, and in 2018 created their admin site, is, which is where they house all of their uh, selling operations for these kits. Uh, in 2019, uh, we actually saw that the Facebook page was banned, uh, and the advertisement and marketing was actually moved to Telegram. Uh, this is not an uncommon move in phishing kits. Uh, Facebook has really cracked down recently on the kinds of content that they uh, allow to be up on their platform. Uh, so this isn't the first kit that we've seen make this transition. Uh, Telegram has fewer restrictions and it's more of a chat app versus like a social media app. Uh, and so this isn't you know, the first kit that's done this. I'm sure it won't be the last. Uh, and then finally, uh, relatively recently, this actor has expanded their kit offerings. Uh, now they're also targeting American Express and Apple as well. Right, yeah, so we'll get to that uh, when we talk about uh, attribution at the end, but he, yes, <laughs> correct. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, he just brought up that this person uh, was doxxed on Twitter uh, somewhat recently, actually a couple months ago, I think, yeah. right, yeah. Um, Yep, <laughs> so we'll talk about that in a bit, but correct, yes, they did. Um, so we talked about this marketing shift, but here's some examples of what this looks like. So Facebook provides a pretty interactive platform in terms of kit interaction and marketing. Uh, a lot of users of this kit or potential uh, buyers were you know, commenting, um, a lot of effort was actually put into this marketing because this person has actually developed uh, some pretty awful marketing videos that demonstrate use of the kit. Uh, but they're relatively well done, so um, it's a good way to get people to buy in a competitive market because there are so many fishing kit offerings. Uh, and then when they move to Telegram, actually, uh, there's a lot less user interaction, and so now the Telegram channel is predominantly just used uh, to post update information. And so uh, in terms of a following, I think this is definitely a huge hit. Uh, this has far fewer members in the Telegram group compared to the 20,000 likes. So uh, I would say Telegram makes it a little more difficult for these actors to market what they're selling. So now let's talk about sales. Uh, in terms of pricing, uh, these kits actually run about $100 each. Uh, that gives you access to all of the features of the kit. Uh, so you can go ahead and just buy one or many or however many you like. Uh, but what's interesting about this actor is that they also sell a mass mailer program uh, that's sold by a yearly license. And so this is a potential source of continuing income for this actor. 
Uh, so, you know, it's nice to make $100 off of a person buying something once, but it's better to make uh, money off of them time and time again, so you can see why this would be used. Uh, if you were to want to buy this kit, uh, you would make a payment to a Bitcoin wallet address, uh, and then you would go and enter that transaction ID into this box that's uh, shown to the left of the QR code. Uh, the actor would verify that, and then they would go ahead and send you access information to the kit. Uh, so you may wonder what you're actually getting for your money. Uh, these kits have pretty standard features across the board from this actor and other actors as well. Um, so like Zach mentioned, we're not really seeing just phishing for credentials anymore. Uh, we pretty commonly see pages that are asking for selfies with government IDs, uh, either photos or full credit card information, um, information that could be used to open accounts in someone else's name, the standard phishing stuff, uh, but expanded from just credentials. Uh, some of the more interesting features, I think, here uh, are the fact that a lot of these kits are now uh, taking pretty extreme measures, I would say, to uh, make themselves seem more legitimate. And so one of the most common features that we see now is the auto-population of things like billing uh, address and stuff like that, uh, because even that little feature can make it seem more reasonable to a victim that they're entering their information into uh, what they think is a legitimate page. So most of these features are pretty standard across the board. In terms of um, like how often we're seeing payments, uh, in the last six months, this person has made about 24,000 US dollars. Uh, so that's quite a bit of money, I would say, actually. Uh, there are transactions to these wallets uh, relatively often, so it is actively being bought. Uh, and when you make a purchase, it's kind of interesting to note that all of the actors that we've seen actually use some kind of uh, digital rights management system. And so when you buy the kit, you generally get like three to five domains that you can register. Uh, if you try to put the kit up on a domain uh, that you have not registered, it just doesn't work. You have to enter some kind of access code or verification code in, a, in, a, in order to get the content to appear uh, as an actual phishing kit. Uh, so this makes sense. Uh, from an economic standpoint, because if I'm a phishing kit author, I want to be able to soak you for as much money as possible. So if you want to put this up on 100 domains, you have to pay me uh, enough money for that to happen uh, versus just paying me $100 for um, unlimited domains. I'm going to talk about education and deployment together because they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so one of the things we've mentioned a couple times is that phishing kits really are trying to market to everyone of every technical ability. And so the easier the kit is to use, uh, the more potential buyers you have because you aren't restricted by your technical ability. And so if you have absolutely no idea what you're doing and you'd like to buy a Casanova kit, uh, you still can because if you can uh, open a terminal window and run a script, uh, the script will actually go ahead and install all of your dependencies for you um, and it will make it much easier. So we really see an effort by these actors to uh, make things as accessible and easy as possible for their buyers. Uh, so related to that, in terms of user support, we also see in general, there is some kind of system for that. So uh, in this case, it's not a particularly good one, but they are active on social media in terms of support. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and uh, hit this guy up on Twitter. Uh, he does appear to respond pretty frequently. So uh, he directs people officially to ICQ, but he seems to just kind of do it wherever you can contact him. Um, and then in terms of another ease of use feature that's kind of interesting with this particular kit, uh, one of the things that I think is more attractive to potential buyers is that you can actually configure your mass mailer. Uh, that is the, the mailer you would use to blast out emails containing links to a phishing site. Uh, you can configure that within the same platform as you would do all of your other uh, phishing kit admin stuff. And so if you're a potential buyer, this is really nice because everything is in one place and you don't have to go to multiple locations to try and get this done. So it does make it more attractive um, in the uh, world of phishing kit offerings when you can do everything at once. So also related to this idea of user support is frequent updates. Uh, this is kind of expected now for modern software, and so we see parallels in phishing kits as we do in the rest of the world, uh, where frequently we see code reobfuscation, uh, which is an attempt to evade detection. Uh, we see additional kits being released that target new things. And uh, again, most of this is to try and gain access to new revenue of some kind. So uh, if you bought one kit and it was successful for you as a phishing kit user, uh, maybe you would also want to buy another kit from the same author. 
So if we were to rate this guy uh, on kind of a video game stat card, if you will, uh, I would say he's got decent marketing. It's all right. Uh, he had a pretty big following uh, in terms of uh, the Facebook group. It's dropped off significantly since the move to Telegram, but it was there at one point. Uh, the ease of use is pretty solid here. Uh, user support maybe not the best because he seems to just do it uh, as like a one-off as it comes up. Uh, the cost of these kits is actually relatively high, I would say, uh, versus other offerings that we see. Uh, and if we were to rate the offset here, it would be a one or a zero, honestly. It would probably be a zero. Um, and so kind of an aside here, uh, usually if you are marketing yourself or your offerings, uh, you have pretty terrible operational security. And so there are a couple potential reasons for that, I think. Uh, one is that this is a competitive market, and so, you know, as you would with any software that you're trying to develop and sell, you really have to stand out in some way and develop a brand. And so that's one of the reasons I think we tend to see this on social media platforms versus like more uh, secretive, like dark web. Uh, type of forums. <laughs> um, but usually this branding goes to the extreme to the point where we actually see these guys straight up put their social media accounts in their code. Uh, so there's really like no level of effort put into hiding identities at all. Uh, so like you said earlier, uh, we're not going to get into this in this talk uh, for the sake of time, but this guy was called out recently on Twitter. Uh, there's really just not a lot that these people are doing to hide uh, where they are and what they're doing. So now I'm going to completely switch gears. We're going to talk about a different group. Uh, this is also one that you probably have heard of if you're at all active in the fishing kit research community. Uh, so this one is called 16 Shop. So again, similar timeline. Uh, we first see the Facebook group that was initially used for marketing created in 2017 uh, in kind of an interesting connection with what Zach talked about earlier with um, Twitter for this. Uh, the first mention of this 16 Shop kit on Twitter was actually in mid-2018. Uh, and then in 2019, the current admin site was registered, so similar infrastructure as Casanova. We have a central site that's used for all of our purchasing infrastructure. Uh, and then kind of an interesting aside here, uh, there was actually a backdoored version of this kit that was released, and so Akame actually wrote a really good blog on this. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, their Facebook group was banned. Uh, this was done concurrently with a McAfee report that was released on a new version of their kit. And they also moved to Telegram. Uh, so again, I already kind of talked about the reasons for that, but we see frequently this um, initial start on social media and then an ultimate move to Telegram where content is a little less restricted. Uh, and then in January, uh, very recently, actually, I think like two or three weeks ago, if even, they just released uh, kits targeting PayPal and American Express. Uh, so we actually released a more technical write-up of this in a blog if you're interested in that. So a side note on backdoor kits that I find actually kind of interesting is that it's not uncommon. Um, <laughs> I guess if you can get out of the expense of having to develop your own kit or having to actually like buy a kit that's been developed, uh, this could be pretty attractive. And so we've seen in the case of Casanova, uh, someone by the name of Phoenix, misspelled, uh, has actually ripped off the kit and it has the exact same contents, but it's branded as someone else. Uh, and so this guy is selling it. Uh, presumably to try and make some quick money off of something he didn't have to develop. Uh, like I said, Akame released this report of a backdoored 16 shop, uh, which would allow people to use it without actually having to pay. So not uncommon, just an attempt to have to avoid putting in the time and money. Uh, so with that, let's get into 16 shop marketing. So like we said, uh, the Facebook page uh, was initially used for this and it has since been taken down. Uh, currently, they are using Telegram. Uh, this Telegram channel is a lot more active than the Casanova channel and so there's a little more user interaction in terms of what they're talking about. Uh, but they do also post updates to the actual kit and what they're doing there in terms of development. In terms of kit sales, uh, similar again as the Casanova kits, uh, these kits are actually quite a bit cheaper. So they start at I think 60 US dollars uh, and go up as high as 110 US dollars. Uh, the $100 one or $110 one is actually American Express and so because that's so new they're actually restricting access to that kit and how many uh, versions of that kit that, would, that will be sold. Um, you get pretty similar features for your money. Uh, so they support uh, phishing pages in multiple languages. Uh, they re-obfuscate the code every so often in an attempt to evade detection. Um, and they also are doing similar pages where they're looking for ID photos, um, kind of a couple of different things in addition to the standard credentials. 
In terms of payment infrastructure, uh, we have observed them using a Bitcoin wallet address, but they've actually moved away from this to something different um, outside of Bitcoin uh, transactions, uh, which makes sense because if you were to convert this to uh, US dollars, it's actually only about $4,000, uh, which didn't match what we were seeing in terms of volume of appearance. Uh, so they're actually just not using Bitcoin at all. Uh, they've gone to a different payment infrastructure, but still similar uh, where you would make a payment uh, you would gain access to uh, code that you could use to register a particular number of domains. Uh, if you were to try and register a domain uh, or put this up on a domain that you hadn't registered, you'd get this uh, nice red X uh, instead of the actual phishing page content. So not uncommon used to try and make additional money. In terms of education and deployment, um, I would say that this group does a better job of user education. Uh, they put some effort into uh, doing YouTube content. So if you're curious about what this looks like, all you have to do is go search for it on YouTube. Uh, and again, they're doing this to try and make it marketable to even people that have no idea what they're doing technically. Uh, the admin panel of this is also relatively straightforward, easy to use, and so that's what we have here uh, in the other screenshot. Um, and so you can see it would really nicely sum up for you all of the information you've managed to collect. In terms of updates, we see similar ones uh, as the ones that I've mentioned with Casanova. Uh, but I actually want to talk about one particular update that we found pretty interesting. Uh, and so this is with the anti-bot capabilities of this phishing kit. Uh, so here in this screenshot is some code uh, from an original version of this, uh, version 1.97 of their Apple kit. Um, and so this was actually just blocking uh, certain IP addresses, certain host names, and certain uh, user agents from a, a hard-coded blacklist. So this is not a feature that's uncommon in phishing kits. Obviously, they don't want researchers to be able to look at this if possible because it makes uh, it more likely that they will be detected in some way. But the more interesting part here uh, is that when they released their PayPal kit, they actually switched to a service called Antibot. And so this was interesting to me because we had been tracking a separate kit that also had thrown up something about Antibot in December. And so I saw this and thought, hmm, that's odd. Um, you know, kind of weird that now we've seen three kits that are using this Antibot technology. And so we dug into it a little more. Uh, this is exactly what the name would suggest. They're trying to block um, bots and crawlers, things like that. And when you look at the company's website, it looks to be like it could potentially be legitimate, maybe. Uh, it's not a particularly suspicious website. But if you go have a poke around on their GitHub and get into their uh, Telegram page, you can see it's all Indonesian, uh, and they've also listed their location as being in Indonesia. And so we poked around a little more on their site, and it turns out that they've left some stuff unsecured. And so we actually <laughs> realized that they all actually were, in fact, partnered, and here it is. Uh, which is kind of interesting. And so uh, Hijal and Kazuli are also Indonesian kits that we've been tracking. Um, similar activity as a lot of the other kits, similar targets. Uh, but it's interesting that they've uh, all decided to partner with this other Indonesian uh, fishing, fishing group. So again, if we were to rate this, I'd say decent marketing, maybe not as good as Casanova because uh, Casanova had such an extensive social media following, probably better ease of use, a little bit cheaper in terms of cost, better user support, uh, but again, very poor OPSEC. Uh, <laughs> not really much of an attempt has been made to conceal identity. There's a lot of call out to um, actual social media accounts and actual name uh, in the code itself, and so it's just really like no effort has been taken to, to hide who these people are. So now with the last couple of minutes, I'm going to completely switch gears. Uh, I want to talk about ways that you can get involved in this if you uh, feel so inclined. Uh, one of my favorite things about doing phishing kit research is that uh, this is a really kind of cooperative open source community, and so there's a lot of collaboration between teams at different organizations. And so I don't think I have too much time to really get into a lot of these slides, uh, but I want to talk about the ways that you can kind of walk through uh, the hunting steps that we do at Zero Fox. So uh, first, you have to identify a phishing URL. Uh, we generally see that there's some kind of like typo or variation of whatever organization is being impersonated. A lot of times this is paired with like a call to action keyword, so like verify or uh, change password or something along those lines. Then we look for open directories, because what we actually want is to steal the content of the kit. 
Uh, and so the way that we do this is we take the base phishing URL and then we walk backwards and try all these directories and see if there are any files that have been left up unsecure. So the jackpot here is the zip file or whatever compressed file uh, of the actual kit that will give you the full contents of the kit and then you can go analyze that and you'll have a lot of useful information there. Uh, but sometimes we just see other files that may have like visitor information or sometimes we've even seen actual victim information that's logged and just left up for anyone to see. Uh, and so really whatever you can find, grab and it's probably useful. If you can't gain access to any of the actual kit files, it's also very helpful, as Zach mentioned earlier, to view the source code. Uh, sometimes they, these kits will make requests to resources that are hosted on the legitimate site that they're targeting. And so that's a huge indicator that this is not, um, this is a phishing kit rather, this is not a legitimate site because if you're seeing like PayPal change password now .com, uh, and it's making a request to an actual PayPal uh, resource, then yeah, that's probably a phishing kit. And so that's a really good way to hunt for these things. And so here's an, op uh, an example of that where we're seeing a phishing kit that's actually making a resource request to paypalobjects.com to load a script. And then again, I've mentioned this briefly, but just be aware of anti-analysis capabilities. Uh, usually they block uh, AWS Tor, and a lot of these actually block particular IP ranges that are associated with research groups. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, if you're seeing a 404 and you suspect that there's actually content there, it's probably because you're being blocked. And then a last uh, couple of things here. Uh, some really useful resources if you're just getting started. Uh, one is URL scan. Uh, this is something that's free. I hope it stays free in the future, but who knows. Uh, this is kind of like a sandbox uh, for web versus actual uh, malware. So you can make submissions to this. Uh, you can search what has been submitted by other users, and it will give you a lot of useful information about the page. Another interesting and useful tool is called Stockfish. So this will do a lot of the um, open directory hunting that I mentioned earlier, and this is also free and open source. And then again, Twitter's great. Uh, a lot of resources on Twitter. Highly recommend taking a look at some of these accounts and giving them a follow if you can. Um, it, I, it's one of my favorite things about this kind of research is that we see uh, so much of this being posted publicly, uh, and it's really useful overall. Uh, so I think we have like maybe a single minute, if that, for questions. Uh, I can hear you. I can repeat your question for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so um, we mentioned like the backdoor, oh sorry, uh, the question was about um, like, a, like a cracked fishing kit market. Um, so we do commonly see that, um, like we mentioned the backdoored Akame kit, or backdoored 16 shop kit that Akame released a report on. Um, we do see that just because actors don't want to pay, right? I'm not going to pay 100 bucks if I can just crack it and use it for free. <laughs> uh, I don't think I have, have so, you? Yeah, the, question. Uh, the question was, have we seen any uh, fishing kits that are containerized? And I don't think that I have, but have you, Zach? Uh, I have not, but that would be an interesting project to work on if, if you want to work together. <laughs> yes. Uh, last question. Oh, yeah, sure. Feel okay. free. <laughs> All right. Any, I guess that was a question, technically. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> before we end it yep. here. All right, we're good now. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time.